Hi there, you're listening to the Bigfoot Society podcast, and I'm Jeremiah Byron. Every week I talk to individuals who have experienced Sasquatch in some way or another, so you won't want to miss an episode. Make sure you're subscribed on the platform that you're listening to and share this episode with a friend. It does not cost a thing, and it helps the show continue to grow. If you'd like to hear Bigfoot Society episodes early and ad-free, you can do so by becoming a Patreon supporter or a YouTube channel member. Links to those are in the show notes. And Bigfoot Society, I've taken far too much of your time so far, so let's get on with the show. All right, Bigfoot Society, we've got the privilege of talking to Mr. Brian Hewlin today. He's a Bigfoot investigator from Oklahoma. How's it going, Brian? It's going great. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. I'll, I'll say, you know, I mentioned it earlier, but you're the first guy that actually has Bigfoot right behind you. Yeah, that's uh, that. So, yeah, that's Ted the Big Red. Uh, I got that just kind of a as a goof and um i don't know he he turned into a character so he has his own facebook page and everything now uh <laughs> I, I you know we're coming up on halloween so what i like to do is i'll get on my front porch dressed you know get ted out there and i'll hold a bowl of candy and i'll move like i'm a robot just kind of mechanical back and forth and kids will come up and they think they're gonna grab all this candy and i'll just go wow oh, one piece you know i'm just scare the daylights out of them so it's a lot of fun so it gives me something to do it keeps me entertained right so yeah there you go right and you're down in uh is it oklahoma city area yeah i'm just on the outside of oklahoma city so to the little bit to the west gotcha gotcha cool 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 uh, you've got a uh, pretty cool podcast going on on YouTube as well. Do you mind talking about that for uh, a little bit? Yeah, uh, my buddy Shane Church and I started the Cryptoholic show a couple years ago. Um, and we really did it just for something to do. You know, we wasn't really trying to do anything super creative or anything. It's real casual. Uh, there may or may not be adult beverages uh, being consumed on the show at, at any given time. Um, we run the show live, you know, uh, there's, so there's no post-production or anything like that. It's just whatever happens, happens. Uh, we've had some, some decent guests on, you know, uh, Lyle Blackburn was on, was one of our, our bigger shows and, uh, uh, Cliff from the, uh, that one show about Bigfoot. And, uh, so he was on there and, I think we're some somewhere in the forties or something like that as far as shows. We we try to do them uh, once every two weeks, usually on Wednesdays. Uh, we had to take a little hiatus when we were under contract for a television series, so we missed about pretty much about eight nine months of of shows during that period. So, oh wow, what was it that actually got you into Bigfoot? Um, did you actually grow up in Oklahoma or uh, how was like your origin story uh, with Bigfoot back in the day? So, yeah, I mean, I was born and raised here um, and Bigfoot just is always just something cool, but I never thought Bigfoot was in Oklahoma. You know, I always thought it was a Pacific Northwest thing. Um, my daughter was probably maybe 12 around the, around that time. And she uh, got into watching those shows on, on TV and on cable and so I started watching them with her and she really took a liking to it. So she wanted to go out looking for Bigfoot, you know, and I really didn't know where to go. We have Southeast Oklahoma. I heard that, you know, there's a Bigfoot festival there and things. And I got in uh, contact with an old friend of mine that I had met years prior. And uh, he had posted something about going out looking for Bigfoot. And so I was like, hey, man, like, can we tag along? And so we tagged along one weekend with that, with him. and some other uh, friends and family of mine and had a little weekend. Like I said, it was my daughter. So when you have that father daughter relationship and you got a little girl that's interested in something, you know, I'm going to be interested in it. Right. Cause that's how we can kind of have that bond. Right. I mean, we could have been looking for leprechauns at that point. It wouldn't matter to me. I just trying to find a way to connect with her. And so uh, we uh, met up with him and then he was on a uh, Facebook group, uh, Bigfoot group. Um, and I joined it and 
it just really never was doing the what I thought a group should do, like an active group. And so I met about six of us, I believe. We all kind of clicked, and they were in between Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Texas. And the six of us decided to break away from that group and create our own Bigfoot group, which is the Southern Bigfoot Alliance. And actually, my daughter came up with that name. So that's that's pretty much what got me in the game. Um, unfortunately, she grew up, matured a little bit, and didn't care anything about Bigfoot or her dad at that point. And she started living her teenage life and, you know, doing all that. But uh, she's a freshman in college now, and so she's kind of circling back in. So I'm thinking, hopefully, I can kind of get her to wrap back into this thing and you know get more involved in it. So that's really cool. So when you were getting into Bigfoot, had you heard of places like Area X and uh, like the Siege event and all that? beforehand or did you get into bigfoot and then you're like oh man i'm in this area this state that has this incredible uh bigfoot lore to it yeah i mean uh the siege of hono is is big, a big deal and, and that's roughly where we have probably the biggest conference in oklahoma uh is where that is where that takes place and so I took her there, you know, when she was little. I didn't know much about Area X uh, at all until I did a presentation in uh, kind of South Central Oklahoma, and I met an individual uh, named Mr. Bill, and that's when I finally caught wind of what Area X is. And at that time, I didn't realize it, but my main research area that we investigate is about 15 miles as a crow flies south of Area X, and I didn't even know anything about those guys being there. So it was kind of ironic that my little out and about just excursions kind of led me to that area without ever knowing those guys were even there. So it was kind of a cool deal. So So you just you randomly picked this certain spot that is pretty close to one of like the I guess you can kind of say like Mecca's in a way of you know, if you're really into Bigfoot, you're like, you know about Area X, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was it was just strange. Um, I spent a lot of time in 2000, I guess it's 17, uh, first part of 18, just driving different areas, looking for different things, just scouting, you know, the southeast part of Oklahoma. Uh, what got me there to this area, we, we call it bison. We talk about it all the time on, on you know, in our group and on and on our podcast. Um, I went there and I was just kind of toying with the idea of what a wood knock was. And I made a, I made a wood knock and I, and I don't typically do that. Uh, and I got a response on the other side of the river and I thought, okay, this, this might be worth checking out. So we kind of started doing some trips there and had a lot of experiences and a lot of good time. And it's, we've been in and out of that area now for, for six years. So. How much time do you think you have actually spent in field in that area doing uh, on-site research? Oh, you kind of broke up on me. I think you asked me uh, what kind of time, how much time I think I spent. Um, well, in 2018, yep. Yep. I, I documented all all my tr all my trips uh, just just on my Google uh, app. And so I went back at the end of the year and counted all my because it's about a four and a half hour drive for me uh, to to that area. And I added up. I spent 62 nights there in 2018. Uh, obviously, not continuously, but in the 12 month span, I, I lived there for for two months out of that 12 months. And this isn't like a campground where you pull your RV up and plug it in and hook your water lines up. This is, this is remote. This is out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, I could stay there for three or four days and not ever see a soul, you know? So uh, maybe the game warden would sneak in there on me right now and then see what I was up to. But uh, it was 62 nights of, of, of remote camping is what it was. So. I know that it's extremely hard to get into where area X is from what I've heard, is it pretty much the same type of thing you getting into this area? Like you're pretty much 
you know, it, it's hard to drive in type deal or not really. Um, most of the road is fairly passable. I mean, even in, in just passenger vehicles. Now, some of the areas that we go into are a little bit more of the logger roads and old Jeep trails, things like that. You don't really necessarily need four wheel drive, but you definitely need a little bit of elevation in your vehicle. Uh, you know, small truck, Jeep, you know, SUV, something like that. Um, we have a guy in our group and he drove a, uh, sm- a lower car, like an Impala or a Caprice, I can't remember, Malibu or something like that. And he got into most of the areas that we got into. So, you know, as long as you're, uh, you know what you're doing and take it slow and be careful, you can get in and out of there. Uh, area X has kind of a rough area from what I'm told as far as the, the, not from the main road, but getting up into that cabin area. I heard that that road's pretty rough and washed out. Um, I don't know mm-hmm. much about that. I, I think it's a private road, whereas a lot of our stuff is logger roads and logging industry is big there in Southeast Oklahoma. So they do a fairly good job of keeping those roads accessible. So I don't want to forget about it. Tell me more about this Mr. Bill guy. <laughs> uh, Mr. Bill is probably, uh, you know, I don't ever call anybody an expert, you know, uh, Bill might be the closest thing to it though, for us, uh, Bill's been around, he's, he's walked the planet, you know, a lot longer than I have, you know, um, he's just a very genuine guy, but he's been doing this way longer than I have. And I've, I've learned a lot from this guy, a lot about their behavior, uh, things like that, what to look for. Um, and he's, he's, uh, his voice has resonated with me, especially in the situation where I had my sighting. So a lot of things that he had told me over, over the last few years, when I was in that situation, it all just kind of came to the forefront and really helped me out. So Bill is a, Bill's an interesting guy. He's a lot of fun. Um, I think Bill is, and I hate to say his age because he'll probably shoot me next time we're in camp, but he's, I'm 47 and I want to say Bill is somewhere around his early seventies. So, but super active guy, still gets out there in camps, still gets out there in hikes. I mean, yeah, he, he, you would never know, you wouldn't know his age if you met him. I guarantee you that. So. Wild. Um, so let's, you said the name of the area is Bison? Bison, yep. Okay. And basically we came, we came up with that so name. Spent, um, I mean, there's no symbolic meaning to it, so. And so you spent about, you've spent about last year, two months in uh, Bison, um, has there been a time when you're in there where you've uh, had any close encounters or maybe uh, visuals or, or is it just mainly you're hearing stuff? You know, lots of audio, uh, howls, whoops, knocks, things like that. But on uh, September 16th, 2018 is when, uh, my buddy Tim Autry and I had a face-to-face encounter. Uh, it was about four thirty in the afternoon. So, wow! Can you can you get into uh, what that situation was like? Yeah, um, it was kind of a what we did with, through uh, you know my group Southern Bigfoot Alliance SBA is we like to hold these open invites to our members to where they can come in and meet with us. We get to meet with them. And I, and I tell people it's almost like a recruiting trip. So, and this is how we got like Mr. Bill and a good friend of ours named Darren, but we have these people come and we are able to go in the woods with them and kind of see how they look at it and, you know, in, information and things like that and how they process it, making sure they're not the kind of people that every broken branch is a Bigfoot and every, you know, glob of dirt on the ground is a Bigfoot track. You know, that's, that's what we're looking for is individuals who don't immediately think Bigfoot. Um, and we was there for this open invite. And I think we had maybe 30 people show up for it. And, and the core group guys, there was at that time, I think five of us in the core. And, um, 
had these folks come in. They were from everywhere, Arkansas, Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma. And everyone stayed Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Fortunately for Tim and I, we were off work Monday, so we were going to stay one more night. And we put people in different areas and places we wanted them to be and for strategic reasons, you know. Um, and then on Sunday, everybody said their goodbyes. And one of the things that Bill had kind of preached to me about was, you know, what, what's their what's their habits? What do they eat? You know, and a lot of people think they eat deer and things like that, where I disagree a little bit. There is uh, most of that area is uh, pine trees. It's a pine forest. And uh, I was looking for hardwood areas mainly uh, areas that had, you know, that grow nuts, uh, like black walnuts in specific. The uh, reason why is because I was hiking one time and I found this, uh, me and a couple of the guys found this flat, big flat rock, and it had a bunch of cracked uh, black walnut shells. And there was a larger rock next to it about maybe the size of, you know, the average guy's head, you know, and it would look like something had been smashing these black walnuts. And so we started looking into these areas and uh, I asked him, I said, hey, let's go into this area. We've never been here. Um, it's a little Jeep trail that goes up. Let's see if there's an area that we can all set up camp and do a little expedition there in the future. And we drove up to the dead end and kind of got out of the truck. And and it's just kind of a lot of weird stuff that happened. Um, we got out and we were walking around, just kind of looking, kind of determined that maybe we could get a few vehicles in there, but in a few tents, but there really wasn't an area to like really turn around. And logistically it wasn't the greatest, but it, a small group could get in there and back down the road. But we had this uh, doe female, you know, deer come running almost like right against us. And she was running full speed. And my first instinct was that something was obviously chasing her. And I thought probably a coyote, maybe a bear, you know, we have some small black bear in Southeast Oklahoma. And uh, so we looked and of course there's nothing with there, but she was just tail up and just flying through there. And um, all of a sudden we, we started hearing what sounded like stuff falling from trees. And we were trying to, you know, determine if it was like just acorns falling and we were kind of like tossing some rocks in the air. And, and we were like, man, it sounds like it's something bigger than acorns. It sounds like it's about a rock inch and a quarter inch and a half diameter. Now, this is just us. You know, we're spitballing this. We're, we're just kind of doing some test sounds. Well, as we're standing there and I keep hearing these over my, I guess it would be my left. And I, we started to walk that way because we could hear them falling over us about 20 yards. And I remember something that Bill taught me about distraction. You know, these things like to distract you. If they can get your back turned, then they can make their escape. You know, that's that's their way. They don't want to just take off running right in front of you. They want you to go away. So as I took a step to my left to get away, you know, to go towards the sound, I remember what he said, and I just quickly turned back and looked to the right. And when I did, I saw this this stump that's about 14, 16 inches in diameter, and I just saw this head pop down, like just duck behind it. And I was like, okay, I see something, obviously. And so I just fixate on it. And it's about... 50, 60 yards out. And, and everyone always says, first thing people ask me, why didn't you just run at it? Well, it's kind of a little finger valleys. So if I would have took, you know, 10 steps forward, I would have went down about 12, 15 feet. I would have lost visual, come back up, you know, so it wasn't like I could just run straight at this thing. And I don't know if I would actually run towards it or not, even though I've said many times I would, but I, I, I kind of kept watching it. And then I saw this thing kind of peek up and it saw me looking at it and it ducked again. Now, at this point, I'm, I'm able to see its hands holding the stump. Tim, my buddy, is walking around looking for rocks that are being thrown. He's kicking stuff on the ground, trying to, and he's talking to me. And I'm carrying a full conversation with him while I'm locked in on this thing. And so <clears throat> another thing Bill said was, these things don't like moving if you're, if you're facing them. You know, you need to be using peripheral vision and, and give the illusion that you're looking away. So I turned my body a quarter to where it was now on my left side and I'm facing this way, but watching to my left. And when I did that, this thing popped up and just stared at me and it's looking at me. It's looking at Tim. Tim's walking around and then Tim, I guess, starts to make a move towards me. And so it ducks. I have Tim come over and, I, and we're standing face to face at this point. And he goes, what's the matter? And I said, I need you to look at something and just tell me what you see. And, and when I say we're face to face, 
we look like we're ready to embrace and have a magical moment in the woods. You know what I mean? Like two guys, you know, like we're, we're in each other's space. Right. And so he's looking at me and I said, I want you to use your peripheral vision and look to the right. And he goes, okay. And I said, there's a stump out there. It's like maybe three or four foot tall. And he goes, yeah, I see it. I said, okay, I want you to stare at it and then just tell me what you see. And he goes, okay. And so he's looking at me. We're face to face, but he's, he's looking to the right. And I'm watching him at this point. I'm not even looking at the stump. I'm watching him. And all of a sudden, I just see Tim's body, like his body shakes, like it trembles. And he was like, you know, like, what the hell was that? And I go, I don't know, man. Just, just keep watching. And he goes, it moved again. It, it, it ducked. It's, it went behind the stump. And I said, okay. And so then I look at it and it pops up one more time. It looks at us, then goes down. Now, this is where it gets really weird. So it's on a little bit of a hill, and this stumps towards the top. And all of a sudden, I saw this thing on the ground, like its chin was on the ground, and it went to the side of the stump, and it was just staring at me. And I'm, I'm locked in, you know, like I'm, I'm watching this thing. And then it moves behind the stump, and then we hear, like, the leaves rustle a little bit, and then we just hear this thing just walk away. And I knew immediately what I just saw. Like I knew because I saw, I saw the face. I could see the, the skin. I saw the hands. I knew exactly what it was. Tim's super excited. And he's like, what was that? What did we just see? What did we just see? And I was like, man, we're not going to talk about it. Like we got one more night to do our investigation. We're going to go back to our camp, which was about 45 minutes away. Even though it wasn't a great distance, it's a windy road kind of, little treacherous on that part of that road. So we got to go slow, hug the hill a little bit. And I said, we're not going to talk about it. We go up there and uh, we get up to camp, we make dinner and he's wanting to talk. I'm not wanting to talk about it. I said, I just want you to think, process it. We'll talk about it later. So we do our whole nighttime stuff and we're out hiking, looking at, you know, whatever. We decided to get a little bit more aggressive that night, make some sounds, uh, just kind of experimenting. Uh, no action. Nothing else that night. We get up the next morning. We make breakfast, break camp. Now, at this point, we have a four and a half hour drive back towards Oklahoma City. And Tim wants to talk about it again. And I'm like, I'm like, man, I said, uh, I don't really want to talk about this. I think we saw a raccoon. And he goes, man, that wasn't no dang raccoon. He goes, that thing was huge. And I was like, well, we'll talk about it Wednesday because it's, it's Monday morning at this point. I said, call me Wednesday and we'll talk about it. So we take the whole four and a half hour drive. And basically, it's silence because he's processing it. I'm processing it. And I don't want to talk about it because the main reason was I didn't want to influence him. And so we get home. Uh, he goes his way. I go to my house. Wednesday, this dude calls me right up. And he's like, all right, I'm ready to talk about this thing. And I said, OK. I said, what did you see? And he said, I, I saw Bigfoot. He goes, what did you see? I said, I saw a bear. And he goes, you didn't see a bear. And I said, I, yeah, it was definitely a raccoon. And he goes, man, why are you doing this? He goes, you know what you saw. And I said, all right. I said, I'll tell you what I saw. I said, I saw Bigfoot. And he goes, I said, how sure are you? He said, I'm 100%. And I said, all right, let's call the guys. So we did a group chat with the five or six of us. Said, hey, guys, this is what we saw. You know, told the story. And I think not that weekend, which would have been two days, but the following weekend, we all were back out there. And we were doing size comparisons and showing, you know, the guys what happened. So, um, pretty, I mean, it was pretty amazing. I mean, it was daytime, like I said, about 430 in the afternoon. So plenty of light, uh, no mistaken identity here. So. That is incredible. Um, if you had to describe the kind of creature that it looked like to you, are you thinking it looked like some kind of ape or something completely different or how would you describe it? Yeah. The best way I can describe it is somebody sent me a picture uh, recently and I, and I didn't even say anything. I forwarded it right to Tim. I said, I just, I just seen the picture, no explanation, no words. And he texts me back. He goes, that looks really similar to what we saw. And it almost was like an Aboriginal man uh, was not ape at all. It was definitely when I looked at it, I felt like I was looking at another guy. OK, I didn't feel like I was looking at anything crazy. It was just looked like a regular guy just with black skin, 
uh, very large hands and very large head and just a shiny, almost like a, a little bit of a sheen to the skin and then dark fur. Not, not like this guy back here. It wasn't like this bright red or anything like that. It was, it was, if not black, it was like maybe a, a dark brown, but not red at all. So, but the weird thing about it was, and I, and then for the life of me, it's, it's bugged me ever since. I never saw shoulders because everyone always asked me, well, how wide was it? I never, ever remember seeing shoulders. And I don't know if it's because. This thing was maybe turned a little bit while it was trying to hide itself behind that stump or the fact that I was so fixated on the face and the hands that I just totally blocked out the shoulders. But that's bugged me since then because I was like, I have no idea how wide the shoulders were on this thing. So. And you said this area is it's about like 45 minutes from your you, where you guys base camp? Uh, at that time. Now, we have multiple camps in this area. Uh, I mean, I can show you pin drops on this place. Um, I mean, it, there's just, there might be 10, 15 different places I can, depending on, you know, maybe the weather or something like that or, or whatever the case may be, or depending on how many people go. Uh, this was an area that, that we call... Uh, I think we call it Camp 1997 is what we call it. Only reason why is because a hunter reported a Bigfoot sighting there in 1997. So we call it that. Uh, so it was actually my first time camping there. So normally where I was, I would drive just a few minutes to a normal camp uh, that we call Homestead. But I wanted to get up into 1997 and spend a night there. So that's why we ended up being there. And I already had all my gear set up there and everything. So, um, and it's at the, I don't say the top of a mountain because it's Oklahoma, so I don't want to give anybody the the false sense that we have these great big tall mountains. But it, it's a pretty pretty darn tall hill, you know. I call it that, and uh, so all my stuff was there, so I, I had to go back there regardless. So, gotcha. After that sighting occurred in that area, have you guys made that like a a normal? Um, area of focus to try to go back there and see if you can have other sightings or yeah i mean uh i mean we've been there i couldn't tell you how many times since then you know that was that was uh that was five years ago i mean we just really passed the five year anniversary of it here a month ago um i mean i was in there just a month or two ago i, was, I, I cruised through there uh i'm may end up going there this weekend, you know, uh, if weather permits, I may run by there. I don't know. Um, but it, it's, we had a little bit of shift of direction because of some things that happened in 2018, 2019, uh, with some, with some really good evidence as far as cast and footprints. Uh, so our attention got shifted a little bit, but bison is still home for us. It's, it's where, it's where we all like to go. It's, it's, uh, it's probably the most ideal location for us, even though we don't have the footprint, you know, the tracks that we find because it's so rocky and it's just hard to find. But uh, between that and our Squatch Creek area that we go to, those are our two main, main spots. And they're both in Oklahoma. Uh, of course, Bison Southeast and Squatch Creek South Central Oklahoma. Interesting. You you mentioned evidence uh, a minute or two ago. Uh, what kind of evidence have you been able to to bring out from that bison area so far? Yeah, bison. As far as evidence goes, it's going to be all audio and then just the visual sighting that we had. Uh, there is nothing that, there that I can just hand you other than audio recordings. Uh, no no footprints there. We saw. Uh, back in 2000, I believe it was 17, end of 2017, we found some small that looked like child footprints. Uh, and that's what we originally thought they were. Uh, we were canoeing uh, one of the, the rivers there, and we kind of just got out on the bank as we saw this persimmon tree. It had a branch that was running horizontal, about 10 foot high, and it was the path was beat down around it. And we th just thought it was odd. And so we got out, checked it, and we found these really small footprints. They were maybe, maybe four to five inches long. Um, 
and we followed them for about a hundred yards. And we were just like, man, why would somebody let their kid run around here barefoot? You know? And then like, just, I guess we kind of just ignore the fact that these things aren't born big. Right. I mean, they, they, they start small. And when we noticed that they were going right through like thorn briars and stuff like that, we were like, okay, this isn't a kid, you know, like this is something else. But at that time we didn't have any casting material or anything like that. We followed it as far as we could. And it got to an area that was heavily disturbed with hogs and things like that. So we lost the the path, but uh, that, and then we found one, what I call uh, kind of a print that looks like four fingers and a thumb. And it was by a little, I call like an ambush area on a game trail. And I think we have, we have photos of that, but I don't have, I didn't get a cast of it. It was up on, actually it was on 1997 before we knew it was 1997. Uh, we just kind of scaled the side of a hill and went up there and found that. But uh, that's probably the, the most important things that we found uh, at Bison. Uh, the audio that I have is just kind of creepy, but uh I mean, I could always send that to you if you wanted to listen to it. So, definitely that that would be really interesting. You, you mentioned you've heard whoops. Um, what kind of? Uh, how would you describe the type of whoops? I've heard different types over the years doing this. But I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah, and and I'm not a big whoop guy. And you probably won't get me to do a whoop, <laughs> you know, on the show. Uh, you know, I think I sound silly trying to do it. But uh, it's I would say more of a howl than a whoop, you know. And and there, like I said, there's no way you're going to get me to try to <laughs> try to recreate that. Uh, I'll, I can send it to you, and you can listen to it and see what you think for yourself. But uh, it's just odd, you know. There, I got some guys in the group that will do that. They'll do the howls, they'll do the whoops, and they'll do that kind of stuff. And uh, I'd rather just be off to the side listening for responses on that. Um, you know, I'm, I, I think I'm a little bit, uh, I don't want to say a little bit, I feel like I'm pretty in tune uh, when I'm out there just because I spent so much time out there. So I'm able to kind of listen for certain things and, and disregard things that I, that I know of, you know, and different types of owls and different other birds and stuff like that. Um, so I don't, I don't like to get into it where I'm making the sound. I'd rather be back observing it. So, Absolutely. Um, just for my own curiosity, um, a lot of times I hear or I take reports uh, from people to do with the podcast where it almost sounds like um, it could be gibbon-ish. Is it anything like that or uh, not even like that at all that you've experienced? Uh, you cut out on me on that. I'm not familiar with the given. I, I, I don't know what that is. Okay. I haven't had any experience that. <laughs> a, a given is a type of um, like a ape monkey that you would you would usually see in the zoo. I would be really curious if you were to look up gibbon sounds on YouTube and then uh, see what your w reaction to those, if that's, if you've heard something like that before in, in that area. Okay. I'm going to make, I'm going to make a note uh, for myself to kind of Google that later and see. So. Absolutely. In Oklahoma, a lot of the reports that I take over the years doing this podcast is you hear a lot of aggressive Bigfoot reports. Why do you think it is that there are so many aggressive Bigfoot encounters that come out of your state? Do you think that's for a reason? No. Uh, I I mean, just from what I experienced... Um, you know, I, I did get hit in the head one time with a walnut and I was by myself. Uh, I don't think it was an aggressive thing. I think it was more of a like, you know, hey, you're you're too close. You need to get away. Uh, Tim, poor guy on his first trip, he took a rock to the back of the neck that kind of whelped him up. But I also oh. think that if it was if it was really if the intention was to really kill us or hurt us severely, um, I think both opportunities it could have. Right. Um, I think, and I hate to say this about my own state, but this goes back to 
some of even our local news and things like that. We live in a pretty severe weather area. And so fear sails, right? And so everything is, is doomsday here. The tornado is massive. The, you know, the, the snow is going to be this, you know, and, and so we're so used to that. I think that people kind of are brought up that way. And so they see something and may, you know, whatever they, people say bluff charge and people say roar and things like that. I think they take that as a sign of aggression. And to me, that's not, you know, uh, this thing was close enough to Tim and I that if it had ill intentions, we weren't going to get away. We were far enough away from the truck. We were unarmed. Uh, we literally just stepped out and walked down, you know, a few yards just to, you know, check out the area. So if that was the case, it had every opportunity to, to get us. Right. And I, I think just some people are naturally going to say that because they're afraid of what they saw or unsure of what they saw. And so it, it's a, it's a, and I don't want to say they're lying and say, oh, this thing and try to attack us or anything like that. I don't think that's what it is. I think it's just misinterpreted. You know, the intentions of it are misinterpreted. I think these things are more curious than anything. And so they may put themselves in a situation that may seem threatening. You know, if you're in a cabin or if you're in a tent or something like that, you may think this thing's trying to hurt you, but I think it's more curious. And if it really wanted to hurt you, you'd probably be dead for you even knew it. So. Gotcha. Have you ever had an experience like, let's say you are in camp, uh, you're trying to sleep through the night. Have they ever approached the camp area and have any interesting interactions uh, happened um, in the campsite itself? Yeah. So the, the night that Tim was hit, um, there was about eight or nine of us set up and we had all of our tents kind of spread out, you know, 10, 15 yards apart. And, uh, we had a grill and one of the guys there had a dog, a little, I think it was a beagle. And, uh, we all, we stayed up pretty late or at least most of us did. And, uh, we weren't really big footing, you know, per se, we were just kind of hanging out and just enjoying, you know, being together and, you know, just doing dude stuff and maybe, uh, you know, telling stories and things like that, joking around. And uh, we decided to finally go to bed. It might have been 3 a.m. And I was out completely. I'm not going to lie. As soon as I got in the tent and zipped it up, I was I was dead to the world. And uh, we had an audio recorder going. And so what you hear is something coming down the side um, towards the tent with the dog in it. And you hear something walking. And you hear the, the dog kind of put a little low growl, you know. And, and, you know, beagles are pretty loud anyways when they start barking and baying. But this thing just kind of did a little little growl. And then you hear the grill, the metal, you know, the metal grill lift. You hear the, the lid open. And then it slams and the dog starts going crazy and you hear footsteps running away. Well, some of the guys were still, you know, fairly light sleepers and, and they got up pretty quick and, they came to me and I, I think I said something like you guys are a bunch of babies or, you know, scaredy cats. I don't remember what I said. And they, I think about three of them, four of them took off running after it. And they had seen a little bit of disturbance in the, in the kind of a rocky road where something looked like it had ran across the road. Of course, we can't say that because obviously we didn't see it run across the road, but they were pretty sure that they, something had ran across the road there. And as they turned in to come back, Tim was at the end of the line, and what I was told is that you hear a thud, and you hear Tim go, ow, and he sees a rock fall by his feet, and he turns around, and they all kind of like, what was that? And he goes, I don't know, and he picks this rock up. He goes, but something hit me in the back of the head. And this is, like I said, this is Tim's first trip with us. Like, we had just met this guy, and uh, he comes back to camp, and they all looking at it with the light, and he has this red welt that's... I don't remember, maybe one or two inches long, right at the base of his neck. So, so that was a pretty cool thing that happened there. Um, and then as far as another threatening deal, uh, 2017, my son and I went deer hunting there and I kind of used it as I can take my son hunting. I can also be in my Bigfoot area. It's a win-win for me. He may get a deer. I may get a sighting, you know, so we went there and, uh, we camped at this place uh, that I call Old Well. And when I say Old Well, so you have to think of 
uh, a concrete well, uh, kind of like in uh, the little girl in the ring, I think, you know, in that movie where she comes up that well and comes into your TV and kills everybody, you know, whatever. Oh boy. Uh, the little horror movie. Yeah. So that's, that's the setting. Yeah. And, and, you know, and I put my tents right next to this thing. I don't know what's wrong with me. Right. So we set our <sighs> tents up next to this. Yeah. And so we're, we got there a little late. And so, uh, my son, he's a big guy. He's, uh, six, two at that time. He weighed probably 275. He's got an SKS. He's like, I'm going to go hunt while you're getting everything set up. And so I'm, I'm getting the tents up. I'm getting the table out. I'm getting the cook stuff out and I'm, I'm going to make some, I think it's like some kind of soup or something that I was making a stew or something. And, uh, I had heard something about 80 to hundred yards away. And the reason why I know that is because I went back later on and tested, uh, how far I could hear somebody walking. And about 100 yards, I can't hear them in that location. Uh, I went back, I think it was two weeks after to test that theory. So I hear something walk in, and my first reaction, because I don't have Bigfoot on the brain, I'm, I'm in hunting mode. And I, I said, I think there's a lot of wild hogs there. And I said, man, I think there's a big hog. And uh, so I, I radioed my son and asking for some ammo, where the ammo was for this gun. And I get it loaded. And I set it there. Well, this thing starts veering off towards him or the direction he was walking. And so I radioed him and I said, Hey, I said, I think a hog kind of walked up towards camp and probably saw me or winded me or something. And it, it turned back towards you. So make sure you're paying attention. And he said, okay. And <clears throat> kind of just let time go by. I'm getting ready. And it might've been 30, 45 minutes later. And he radios me and he says, uh, he said, dad, he goes, uh, I just had something weird happen. And I said, what was it? He said, a rock was thrown at me and it landed in front of me. And he goes, it rolled right up to my foot. Cause he's sitting on the ground up against a, a tree. We don't have stands there or anything like that. And I said, well, you need to, you need to grab your stuff and come back. And he goes, I'm not, I'm not doing your Bigfoot deal. He goes, that's not what this is. He, he's a non-believer just so you know. And, uh, and I'm like, Ty, I'm like, man, I, I know what that is. Like, and, you need to you need to pack it up and come on back. And he goes, I said, how big was the rock? He said, it's about the size of a softball. And I said, okay, yeah, you need to you need to head this way. And he goes, no, nah, I'm not I'm not going down that Bigfoot road with you. I'm going to stay here until it's dark. And I said, okay. I said, but you know, keep your head on, right? Pay attention. A few minutes goes by, and he finally radios him back and says, okay, I'm I'm going to head that way. So I'm still cooking. And I hear something a few minutes later running towards me. And I thought it was him. So I radioed him and I said, what are you running from? And he said, dad, I'm not running. I, he goes, I haven't even got my stuff in my backpack yet. He said, I'm just standing. And I was like, okay, well, I heard something running. And he said, you wouldn't be able to hear me. He goes, I'm at least a mile from you. And at first I was like, man, this kid did not walk a mile. Like I just... I don't think he's got it in him to go a mile, you know? And, and I asked him, I said, well, how do you know you're a mile away? And he said, well, I passed two creeks. Okay. So at that point I knew that he was at least three quarters of a mile to that second Creek. And I said, okay. I said, well, it's getting dark. So make sure you head straight North. He's like, I got a compass, you know, and we're talking an area that's hundreds of thousands of acres. Right. And, uh, and I said, okay, make sure you head North. I said, you'll hit the road if you don't hit me. And he said, okay. So I see him through the tree lines. I see him coming through the woods and he's got his flashlight and it's already getting dark there, you know, inside the, inside the woods. And he's probably 80 yards off target from where we are. So I step out to the little gravel road and I just kind of hit the light. He sees me and he walks down and we're talking about the rock and he's just like, he's not having it. He's like, I'm not going to, I'm not even going to go there. And uh, I said, okay, well, I got food ready and, so we're sitting in our chairs, and of course, I got an audio recorder going. I have it sitting right next to me on this little table right between us. And across from us, and I don't know how far out, but it would be to the north, there is this howl. And he just looks at me. And then behind us, where he was, was a what I want to say is a male. Like, it just... One sounded female, one sounded male, or one was younger and one was bigger, okay? But definitely had a, a deeper tone to it. 
So this thing yells behind us, and then coyotes just go ballistic. I mean, they're, it's just eerie what you hear. And he looks at me, and he goes, what was that? And I said, that's exactly what threw that rock at you. So he gets up, goes over, grabs his pistol, sets in his lap. We keep eating. Now, where it gets really weird and kind of just goofy on my part, and like it ain't weird enough, right? Uh, I take the audio recorder and I set it on the roof of my truck, thinking higher elevation, I'm going to get better sound. It's not going to get all the sound of me and him talking and eating and things like that. I don't know if I paused it or if it being vehicle caused something but all the recording stopped after that and it's just nothing but silence you don't hear any birds you don't hear crickets you don't hear nothing okay but during that night he's in his tent i'm in my tent this thing is still behind us screaming at us about every 45 minutes to an hour and it does it the entire night now Seeing that's my son, and I don't get too spooked out, but I had the rifle, I had the pistol, I had a knife, and I had an axe all inside my tent. Like, I'm ready to go. Like, if this thing comes up trying to think I'm a sack lunch, like, it, it's going to get it. You know what I mean? Like, something's going to get it, right? And it does it all night, and I'm just staring. I just remember staring at the top of my tent thinking, this thing's going to come and just grab us. You know what I mean? Like, it's super aggressive. You know, it sounds super aggressive. And I lay there the entire night. We get up to go hunting that morning. And he's just like, Dad, he's like, what in the world was that all night? And I said, man, I said, I don't know. I said, that thing just would not quit. So we go hunt that morning. And I tell my group, I send the group chat out. Hey, guys, got some cool audio. This is what happened. Blah, blah, blah. So one of the guys in uh, Arkansas, Kendall, he messaged me and said, hey, what do you think the odds are of this happening again tonight? And I said, I don't know. I mean, we're here. And he goes, well, I'm going to come. So he drives in, camps with us, does it again that second night. So I don't know what it was, what it meant. I'm not sure, really. I mean, but it we have it on audio. And Shane, uh, my co-host, he's a uh, you know, graphic artist and stuff like that. He does a lot of stuff with audio and he ran it through some stuff and we were trying to find like the pitch and, I, and I'm going to be horrible at describing this, but the only thing that kind of matches it from what I'm told, and there's a YouTube video about this is it's almost like a whale at that level. And we know we don't have whales in Oklahoma, uh, even though there's a law here where you can't hunt whales, which doesn't make any sense, but uh, it, it's on that, it's on that spectrum of sound. So I don't know. It's definitely not, Definitely not coyotes. And I had a guy tell me, he's like, oh, that's just a, a rogue wolf that's running through Oklahoma. Uh, I don't know about all that either. So that is, that is a wild, wild story. And man, I, I would love to hear, uh, if, if possible, I would, I would love to hear that audio. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. Huh? Yeah. I'll definitely send the audio to you. So I'll send it to you on Messenger so you can listen to it. I'm going to take a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to take a little bit of a detour. Okay. Um, something I've been asking everyone is, and this is a weird, this is, it's weird. Um, have you ever encountered or heard of someone in your state or anywhere? that has seen something that looks like a hyena? You mean other something other than a dog man? Uh, I guess that could count, yeah. Yeah. Uh, dog man sightings are pretty common here in Oklahoma. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, a friend of mine, uh, I guess it was three months ago, maybe, maybe not even quite that long, maybe two months ago, uh, she was traveling I-40 into Arkansas, and um, and she's not a Bigfoot person or anything like that. She probably thinks it's kind of silly, but she called me and said, I saw the weirdest thing on the side of the road, 
And she goes, and me and another car both saw it. We both hit our brakes. We both kind of looked at it, looked at each other. And they're on the interstate. Like, they're they're cruising. It's daytime. She said, this thing looked like a bear in the face, but it had like a dog's body with a tail. And it was solid white. And, and she said it was what she thought was it was grazing. Or it could have been eating something dead in the grass. But as they pulled up to it, it raised up and just looked at both the cars as they went by. And so I don't know if that's some kind of weird dog man or some kind of who knows what that is. But uh, I sent her some pictures of some dog because she didn't even know what a dog man was. She kept calling it a bear dog is what she called when she messaged me. She was I saw some kind of weird bear dog. And I sent her a picture, a couple of pictures of what, you know, dog men look like. And she was like, yeah, that's that's kind of it. But it was white. And I thought, well, that's, that's strange. And I have a friend here that, you know, he's a he's a dog man guy and he's documenting a lot of cases. He's got a really cool interactive map of dog man sightings. And so I gave the, the story to him so he could so he could document that. So. That is extremely interesting. I've never heard of a of a white one like that, so I'll definitely have that on on my radar. Uh, do you mind talking about? Uh, you mentioned there was another area that you guys researched called Squatch Creek. Yep, uh, Squatch Creek is South Central Oklahoma. Um, it's probably our greatest collection of evidence, uh, from cast to to actually a couple of hair samples, and. It started with a young girl that was uh, hunting mushrooms, uh, morel mushrooms, which are kind of a big thing here in Oklahoma. And she posted a footprint in this morel mushroom site and people were kind of teasing her about it. And she said, uh, basically she was looking for mushrooms and she found a couple of these really huge footprints in this creek. Um, I contacted her, offered her um, a little bit of money to uh, take me to her morel mushroom site which is kind of a big no-no if you're a mush you know mushroom hunter and i had to reassure her that i do not like morel mushrooms i don't eat them i don't hunt them um we went there and uh there was four footprints and i able to grab two casts and um inside one of the footprints in the mud was a hair on both sides kind of a reddish brown hair almost about like my beard when it used to be a little, a little bit redder and the gray kind of is forcing all the red out but uh, we extracted both hairs, and uh, I still have one. I'm sending it to uh, Darby Orcutt, who's doing some stuff at North Carolina State University. Um, I'm in the process of trying to meet up with him and get that hair to him. The other hair I sent to another uh, person at another university. I'm not going to mention his name, uh, but uh, he's ghosted me for the last five years, and uh, looking forward to talking to him in person, hopefully one day. But uh, we have been to Squatch Creek several times, um, probably have cast tracks on maybe five or six occasions over about a three-year span. Uh, we have all these dates documented on our page, 16-inch um, tracks, at least two different uh, individuals, uh, just because we know the toes are different. One has a uh, kind of like a spade-shaped big toe, and the other one has a round, almost more human like big toe. So we know we have two that are 16 inches and then we have another one that's 20 inches and we have cast them separately and together. And as a group between the five, six of us, the core guys, uh, we have close to 15 of those spread out between us. Wow. Those are, that is pretty, those are big tracks. Have you, have you ever heard any, um, any vocalizations or anything else in that area as well? No, no, no vocalizations, uh, no visuals. Uh, Shane kind of calls the place Jumanji uh, just because some of the weird things that are going on there. Um, we know there's an alligator in the lake, uh, which is kind of weird for Oklahoma, but there is an alligator in the lake. Uh, we saw the tracks. We talked to a guy that lives there. He's, He's the one who told us there was an alligator in the lake. But the craziest thing that we found there with a game camera 
and we have a camera sequence of a, a, a longhorn, you know, cow. And behind it is a real uh, female African lion that is ears back, tail out, and she is stalking uh, this thing. And everyone always thinks like, well, what in the world is an African lion doing in Oklahoma? And how is that possible? Uh, I don't know if you watched Tiger King on Netflix. It was a big thing a few years ago during COVID. Uh, but this place is a, you know, stone's throw away from, you know, that place where Joe had all those lions. So either it's somebody's line that they couldn't keep up with, or maybe it escaped or something like that. But um, we called the uh, local game warden when we got the, the photo and, I said, "Hey, man! I said I'm about to send you a picture of something, and I just, I just want you to look at it, and I want to, I want to send it to you while we're talking." And he said, "Okay." And I sent it to him, and he, his words were, "You've got to be kidding me." And I said, "No, sir." I said, "This is real." And he goes, "You're not pulling a prank." I said, "No." I said, "I'm going to send you a pin location of this camera." And he said, "Okay." He goes, "Do me a favor. Do not talk about this. Do not send this photo to anybody. We don't want to panic anyone." And I said, okay. And, and we did, we kept it quiet. Uh, I messaged him several times over like the next year. Uh, he never returned my calls, never returned my, any of my texts after that day. Uh, I was curious, like, did you guys do anything? Did you catch this thing? Because this is a, uh, a recreational area and like people hunt there, people fish there. There's people that live close by. And I was like, and it's a really small town, but I felt like, man, we're not really doing, you know, justice with people. If there's a, if there's an African lion running through, you know, these woods, like people need to know about that, you know, uh, cause I camped there and I didn't, I didn't know, you know? Um, so fast forward another year. So we're two years away from that photo and, uh, I'm on a Facebook page. It's like a, like a police scanner, you know, they just talk about, you know, whatever, crazy methadonian running down the street naked or something. You know, you never know what you're going to see, you know, on this Facebook page. And I'm reading this deal and it says uh, a, a lion is in the middle of I-35 sitting up watching cars go by. And I'm like, okay, I know where that town is. It's not extremely far from where I got my photo from. And now there's hundreds of people that are witnessing this thing. Like people were commenting like, yeah, I saw her. She's standing there. She's just sitting there watching cars go by. It's the middle of the day. And so we decided at that time, hey, it's been a while. We've reached out to these people. They are not responding. Let's go ahead and post the photo. So we posted the photo of the lion. So, so that's why we call it Jumanji. So. That's yeah, I, I would definitely call it Jumanji as well. Is that uh <laughs> you guys have like a Facebook page or or something like that where people can see that photo? We do, yeah. The Southern Bigfoot Alliance, there's a, that's a Facebook page for the group. And then of course we have a page also for the Cryptoholic show. And then of course you can find me on Facebook. There's only two of us in the world, so and the other guy don't look like me. So awesome. Has there ever been anything where you're out in the woods and let's say not Bigfoot related, but you just, you can't explain what it was. Anything else weird happened to you that's outside, you think, the realm of Bigfoot? Um, paranormal stuff. Um, I have a uh, oh, really? near full body apparition walking next to a lady uh, that I was dating at the time. Uh, I believe it to be Native American. She's Native American. I didn't see it, you know, walking with her, but I took a photo of her because uh, she was walking kind of far away, a little bit farther than I care to for her to get away from me in that, in this area in Bison. And um, we was at an area that we call Homestead. There's a, it, it's obviously there was a house or something there at one time. There's a root cellar. In, in the side of the hill, there's this great big walnut tree that if you were going to build a house in this area, that would be the spot, you know, to build it. And uh, I just kind of took a photo of her. I was grilling some steaks that honestly, it was it was a it was a date night and she's a Bigfoot lady. And this is what Bigfoot couples, you know, do, you know, and uh, 
so I was grilling some steaks and we were just going to just kind of hang out in the middle of there and eat some food. And I took a photo over and didn't think anything about it. And, um, we came back and we were sitting there and it's, it's dark. And all of a sudden I hear, we both hear, uh, what sounded like a bird flapping above our heads. And I thought it had to have been an owl. And so I look up and there's nothing over us, but I can just hear this whoosh, whoosh, whoosh sound uh, over our head. And uh, all of a sudden she goes, I got the oddest feeling. And she goes, and I don't feel like something, something's not right here. And we were eating the steaks and our baked potatoes are wrapped in full and they're still in the fire. You know, we're waiting on them to cook. And, uh, and I said, yeah, I said, uh, I don't get spooked. And I've been here many, many times. I said, but I really feel like I need to leave. And she's like, yeah, I agree. So we we got the baked potatoes out of the fire. We kicked the fire out, watered it down, threw everything in the truck, jumped in the truck, and we started driving off. Well, she was singing this Choctaw song, okay? And she's Choctaw Indian. And she was singing it because it's a it's on a recording. And and I kept telling her, I was like, I don't, you don't even know what you're singing. Like, you, you know, you probably shouldn't be singing that. And then keep in mind, I have not seen the apparition yet at this point. And so we're driving away and we get about halfway out. So from Homestead to the highway, it's about a probably a good 30 minute drive of just gravel road, back road type stuff. And uh, it's real close to the Oklahoma, Texas, I mean, Oklahoma, Arkansas line. And so we get about halfway and and I automatically just feel better. And like, yeah, she goes, if the air is different. And I said, yeah, no, if it feels normal again and she goes yeah i think so too and i said what do you want to do she's like let's just let's just leave and let's just get out of here so she starts singing that song again and i'm like hey man you gotta you gotta stop singing this song it's kind of creepy you know what i mean because i don't know what you're working up over there you know and so she calls her niece and um who is also choctaw and speaks choctaw and she's like hey i keep singing this little verse can you tell me what it is and she sing says it to her it's something about um, something about a, a sinner paying for their sins or something to that effect. And we both kind of looked at each other and we're like, what in the world are you singing? Like, you don't need to be singing that out there, you know? So I don't know if that related to it or if it was just coincidental. I don't know. But that was one thing that was probably pretty weird. Um and then maybe about six months prior to that, I was in that exact same location. I was by myself. I was doing a, a weekend by myself. And I actually stopped there because I had cell phone service in that in that spot. And so I pulled up and I was in a, you know, three quarter ton Dodge truck, you know, and I uh, I stopped, killed the truck. It was on the phone and it was late. It was probably 10, 1030 at night. And uh, I was sitting there talking to someone and and I just felt the whole truck shake. Like, like side of the bed just pushed it. And, uh, and I was on the phone. I was like, man, that's weird. I said, I feel like somebody pushed my truck. And she was like, well, what are you going to do? And I was like, I'm going to get out and check it out. And she's like, if you're by yourself. You need to start the truck and drive away. And I'm like, no, I'll call you back. I hung up and I jumped out and I got my light. Of course, I had a pistol at that time. And I'm kind of just checking the area, but I never saw anything. Like there was no... No kind of prints on the truck. There was, I didn't see any prints around the truck. Uh, obviously, there was nobody there, you know, but whatever it was, it, it moved the truck enough to where I could, I kind of moved, kind of swayed like that in the cab. And I thought that was, that was pretty odd. And this is heavy force. It's not like, you know, wind came through and caught the truck or anything. So little things like that, you know, are kind of strange. Um, you know, eye shine, stuff like that. Uh, growls, things like that. Uh, that's probably getting more on the Bigfoot side of it, but definitely some weird paranormal stuff out there. So, that is really <clears throat> interesting. It make me. It, it would definitely make me think, you know, about about going out there. Um, just a question for you, as an Oklahoma Bigfoot researcher, have you ever looked into the events? of the siege that happened about, I think it was about 20 years ago, right? I believe it was. Um, you know, I, I talked to a guy that was there. Um, I tried to get him to come on my show. 
I have not been successful in that yet. I'm still going to try to uh, talk him into it. Um, yeah. But I, as far as I know, the uh, cabin slash house is no longer there. Uh, it's It's been demoed. Um, the uh, Honobi Bigfoot Conference that they have there is really close to that. Uh, I mean, it's walking distance from where that, that event took place. So I've heard mixed things. I've heard, I've heard the story, you know, like everybody else has heard the story. Then I've also heard that it was, that's not exactly how it went. There were some other things that happened that aren't in the story. So I, I don't know, you know, you know, those kind of things can be after time. So I would love for him to come on the show one day and, and kind of just tell his side of it. So hopefully I can, I can make that happen. Absolutely. I mean, it's such a, it's one of those stories that I feel like maybe people around right now, a lot of them haven't heard, but some maybe half and half, I don't know, but I would hope there's at least some truth to that story. I know it's kind of become like a, a tall tale, like legend of the Bigfoot community, but I hope there's some truth to it. Yeah, I mean, given the location uh, and the history, you know, before that and after that, um, something something happened there. Something happened. I, I don't have any any question about that. Uh, not exactly what took place and what went down, and I don't know. You know, who who, who knows? Uh, but the possibility of it happening in that location, I would I would rate it pretty high. So. Was there, so there was stuff that happened in that same area after that whole thing went down? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of sightings in that area. Uh, Honubi, from Honubi to my area in Bison, Area X, you're talking, I don't know, maybe 20 minute drive on the highway there. It's, it's, it's relatively close. Wow. Very interesting. It's on my, my bucket list to at least make it down to the state from Iowa. And uh, that conference does sound very cool. I've been looking into it. So hopefully uh, one day make it down there. And there's a few people from Oklahoma that won't talk to you unless they meet you in person. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, this year, you know, uh, earlier this month, Shane and I were speakers at that conference. It was the first time we ever done that. Uh, so we did a presentation, did a, a two-hour uh, run on Friday and a two-hour deal on Saturday. Uh, Troy asked us to come back next year. So we'll be speakers next year, too. So if you want to try to make it next year, it would be a, be a good time to try to come. So Absolutely. Getting near the end of our our chat, um, one last question for you. Let's say there's someone who you know they're into Bigfoot. They want to they want to come down look for Bigfoot. Is it a thing where you can just go in and start looking in an area, or did they? I know certain parts of the U.S. You got to be aware of rough terrain creatures that are poisonous is Oklahoma like that yeah I mean we got a lot of things that get you you know um I mean you got depending on where you go we got rattlesnakes we got bears we got mountain lions obviously we got an African lion running around in southern Oklahoma uh, so yeah there's some things you really got to watch out for and be careful about and you get out southeast and eastern Oklahoma you're you're talking hundreds of thousands of of just forest, you know? And, and I think that's the thing people think a lot of people think Oklahoma is just a super flat, super plain area, you know, and that we all kind of ride horses everywhere we go. And it's not the truth. You know, we have, we have that, you know, Western Oklahoma is pretty flat, not a lot of trees, but you get over into green country on the East side of Oklahoma and it's, it's a lot of forest, you know, and you can get in there and get lost pretty quick. Um, but, you know, if you're new to Bigfooting and you want to just go somewhere, you know, go southeast Oklahoma. 
You know, there's a little touristy town there called Hocha Town. Everyone goes there, rents cabins. It's, it's, a, it's like one of the top 10 destinations in America, you know, right now. Uh, go there. You know what I mean? The whole town is, is Bigfoot themed. You know, there's Bigfoot uh, merchandise you can buy. There's stores named after Bigfoot stuff. And so go there, rent you a cabin. And I'm not, you know, I don't have any property there. So I'm not trying to make any money off this deal. But go there, rent you a cabin. Spend the week, spend a weekend, whatever, uh, and drive around, you know, around Broken Bow Lake and and to the north there and go into the, you know, McCurtain County or, yeah, McCurtain County Reserve and and check it out. Um, I wouldn't recommend a beginner just to get out their vehicle and start hiking, you know, obviously, uh, but drive around, you know, nose around, see what you see, you know. I mean, worst case thing is, you know, you have a good time, you know, so. That's awesome. Yeah, that's good advice. I love it. Um, Brian, this has been a really enjoyable chat with you. I always love chatting with people about Oklahoma and Bigfoot. Such a good time. Do you mind taking a few minutes uh, letting my listeners know about how they can keep up to date with yourself and the Southern Bigfoot Alliance? Yeah, you cut out on me again. I've still got connection. But yeah, Southern Bigfoot Alliance, uh, go there, join the group. I think we're 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 not a huge group. I think we're around forty three hundred people, you know, as far as members. Uh, but yeah, check it out. Shane and I are pretty active. We like uh our big thing is was any kind of evidence we have we want to share, our locations we share, we don't keep anything secret. Um uh, if you join the group and you wanna say, Hey Brian, I wanna go to your bison area, I wanna I wanna go see what you're talking about. I'll send you a pin drop, man. You can go. Like I'm, I'm, it's not my place. I'm not trying to keep it private and be all sneaky about it. Uh, if you want to look at our cast, let me know. You know, uh, heck, if I need to, I'll make you a replica and send it to you. You know, uh, we we believe in sharing everything we have. So we we want people to to look at. It. We want people to give us feedback, even if it's ugly. You know, if you if you look at something, you say, Brian, that you're full of crap. That ain't real. You can tell me that, you know, you're not going to hurt my feelings. My mama doesn't believe me when I tell her about I saw Bigfoot. So uh, if you tell me that, that I didn't see Bigfoot, it ain't going to affect me. I'm going to sleep just fine, you know. Uh, but we want to really stress the alliance part of, of it. And that's why we have that in the name. And, uh, you know, like I said, check us out on the Cryptoholic. And you never know what you're going to see there. So That is fantastic. Oh, Brian, such a good chat. Thank you so much for hanging out with me tonight, man. Yeah, appreciate it, buddy. Thanks for having me. Here at Bigfoot Society, our goal is to provide a platform for those that have encountered Bigfoot to share their encounter in a safe and respected environment. But we need to hear your story. If you've experienced something that you just can't explain, please send me an email at bigfootsociety at gmail.com. Then we can start the conversation. And I know a lot of you have not shared your encounter at all. It's been 20 years and it's time that you get this off your chest and then you can get some well-deserved rest because I know you haven't been sleeping. I understand what you're going through and I appreciate every one of you listening. <laughs>